girl, stop playing. Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. Y'all already know that I believe you can have it all. You can make the money and you can get the honey as long as you are willing to work. And so I am here to bring you information and conversations to help you do just that. Now, today we have an amazing woman in the studio for Girl Stop Playing, somebody who is definitely not not playing with their potential or their purpose, Miss Avita Robinson. She is a travel, not just a travel influencer, she's a travel advocate, a travel educator, the creator, the founder of the No Madness Tribe. And it is just an honor and a pleasure to plug y'all in with some people who are not just talking about it, but they really are about it. So Avita, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. And I appreciate that. It's funny. I just posted up something on social media where I was like, we're walking our talk. It was something that we just, for our festival, we just tossed it out. And I was like, looking at these panels and just what we're putting together, I'm just, I'm really excited for what we have coming down the pipeline. But yes, walking your talk, very important. It is super important. And so I want to just um, start by asking you, like, what was your, we're going to get into Nomadish Tribe, of course, but mm -hmm. what were you doing prior to stepping into entrepreneurship? Mm, I was working in television production. Yeah. So I'm a media head and you see it with the way like relationships that we've garnered over time with no madness and also just things that I've done, things that are coming that I can't talk about. Um, there's always been a media aspect to me. So I went to school for television and video production. I always knew I wanted to be at some point in front of the camera and definitely work behind it. Uh, and so I was freelancing in TV. And at that time I was very broke. <laughs> I was living in the Bronx. I was freelancing and I was doing everything from transcribing shows to PAing on different shows um, to associate producing at one point in time. And it was a lot of reality TV. We were in like mm -hmm. the throes of reality and competition shows being everything that we consume. And so I, I come from the world of media. I love it. That seems like yeah. such an exciting space. I said, you know, if I could go back and do it all over again, mass com would definitely have been my thing. But, you know, yeah. you don't know what you don't know until you realize you ain't. Yeah, sure. that was literally um, my degree. Mass com with a focus in TV and video production. And then I minored I in fine that. art. I'm such a creative. Everybody knows me as this like boss that, you know, built No Madness Travel Tribe and like all of these things. But the truth is I'm a creative at heart and I'm kind of like an accidental entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and saying yes to community and the things that kind of came my way and kind of just being like, well, what is this? Let's like play with it for a little while. And now 11 years later, here we are. Ain't playing no more. Yeah. So, so that brings me to my next question is how did you actually get into entrepreneurship, but specifically the travel space? Yeah. So entrepreneurship like snuck its ass up on me. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Um, it really did. Because even when I started, I got into travel before I got into entrepreneurship. So um, for me, I had graduated from college. I went to Iona College, graduated in 2006. And um, right after school, I didn't go get a job. I was actually the commencement speaker of my graduating class. And I was like, Everybody, you know, talks about how everything they can't wait to see. What are your decisions for the real world? I said, as if everything that you've done so far has been fake. And um, that definitely got some cheers from the crowd because we've been working our asses off in school, you know. Mm -hmm. And but one of the things that was really stark in contrast to me and the rest of my graduating class is everybody was hustling for a job and I wasn't. Um, everybody. I mean, I know people where we graduated on a Friday and Monday they were starting, you know, jobs at fortune fortune 500 companies and it was just like i feel like a break is worthy i feel like i'm you know self aware enough in this space to know that i don't know everything about myself and i damn sure don't know everything about the world and so while everybody else was looking for jobs right after college i went and traveled um mm -hmm. i signed up with the new york film academy to do a filmmaking certification in conjunction with my tv background at school cuz i didn't know artistically which way i wanted to go and, um, and so I ended up doing about a month and a half in Paris mm. and it was absolutely life-changing for me. It was life-changing, not just to be in Paris and be able to like 
take a train to Amsterdam and do all these things literally when you're very raw right out of graduating college. But it was life changing for me too, because I was there doing work that I loved. I was producing mm -hmm. films as a part of this like gig. I was amongst, you know, almost 200 other creatives from literally all around the world. And so our conversations were very international. I was being like soaking in information I'd never had before. And um, that's where the travel bug really started for me. It was living in Paris. I had lived in, um, taught English bartend and bartended on the weekends, living in Japan for a year. Um, I moved to Thailand for a number of months. I was cast on a travel uh, YouTube series and I was supposed to be there for three months, but I got stung by a mosquito and caught dengue fever. So after a couple bouts in the hospital in Chiang Mai, Thailand, I decided to come home. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of my early travel um, was wrapped around creative crafts, right? And um and this bridge that I have with the media world that I was coming from and also backpacking, you know, like making it work and figuring it out with like nothing at that age, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that was really how I got into travel. So I started blogging and becoming a photographer and, you know, eventually, especially when I moved to Niigata, Japan, that year that I was out there, like just started documenting my whole life. And I wasn't seeing anybody that looked like me out there doing it, even on social at that time. Cause you remember no madness. We started in September of 2011, like Instagram wasn't even a thing. Right, so right, this right. whole idea of a travel influencer, which I have my own issues with that term, but like, well, at least for myself, but like the, the idea of a travel influencer and what you see now and all these pictures, like the, literally the platforms weren't even created yet, mm -hmm, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, let alone the people and their position. So yeah, it was, uh, it was me out in the world, really bridging my media and vlogging, you know, without, without a, a care in the world um and responsibilities and just trying to figure it out yeah okay so i love so many things about what you just said one of the things that i feel like is a constant conversation that i'm having is the fact that our community our parents don't often allow us to have that space we yeah. don't get that you know i think I think people call it like the fifth year or so we don't get that mm -hmm. time to take a break to breathe yeah. to appreciate what the work that we had just you know put yeah. in the there's no gap year and there's europe the gap year, gap gap year. year. what's what interesting called. what's interesting though and please hold your thought because i love where you're going with this but i wanted to say this in europe the gap year actually doesn't happen after university the way that people think of it here it happens after high school after high school right yeah yeah yep. much younger yep. much younger yep. And that to me is like definitely one of those, I say like black people, we're like late to the party in a lot of these conversations. Like we're just now tapping into some of the things that other cultures, other communities have been incorporating and we're just late, you know? And and our parents, there's like a clip going around from some reality show right now. And it literally, it starts out with a, a, a black girl talking to her mom and her mom is like pressuring her. Like, what are you going to do after college? You got to be, you know, looking for a job. What career path are you going to go down? And then it switches to this, you know, young white boy that's sitting around with his family and his family's like, well, no pressure. You don't have to know what you're going to do. Like I had no idea what I was going to do. And now I'm, you know, I've been in the Senate for 25 years and it's just such a difference yeah. between the pressure that we put on our children versus the freedom that other communities and cultures um, are afforded and get to experience. So the fact that you at a very young age was self-aware enough and daring enough to go out there, do your own thing, carve your own path, you know, and really be willing to just try it because what better time to just explore than you know when you have that freedom when you you know you might be in some debt from those student loans but you don't really have bills that you're responsible yeah. for so i mean i, I pulled out a credit card and yeah, did what yeah. needed to be done i also ate the same thing every day because i knew how much it would cost when i was living in paris and i yeah. shacked up with a friend you know my best friend from high school was in paris and it just so happened that our dates overlapped she had been living out there on a work and study program, um, a broad program through her college. And I was like, look, I want to do this workshop. I don't want to do it in New York because I'm already here. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm looking at Florence, Italy, Paris, France, and Tokyo, Japan. And she was like, well, if you come here, you can stay with me for free. And it was this tiny ass flat in Paris, but it did everything that we needed it to do. It it you know work. what I'm saying? And so it just, it ended up working out. There was a lot of serendipity and I think divine timing that also came into the equation with the decisions that I made. And, you know, my family was living vicariously through me and it took me catching dengue fever 
for them to start saying things that I was hearing other people say that their mm-hmm. families would say, like, you need to settle down. I was like 25. They're like, you need to settle down. You need to figure out exactly what you're doing, all of these things. And I'm like, damn, y'all have been like riding with me now for about four years. What is the deal? But what ended up happening was that was when I realized I couldn't really identify with my family per se, but I could identify with other travelers that look like me, had the same background and interest, but that I was meeting out on the road while I was in these countries. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that was why I created Nomadness because I was like, I can't, I'm starting to get a little like weird energy (laughs) Mm -hmm. on the home front and I need to figure out where my tribe is. And, and I ended up creating it. And I started with a hundred people. The majority of them were folks I had already known or had met while I was, uh, you know, backpacking at that point in time. And now we're like 31,000 members from around the world and primarily black women. So it's just, it's, you never know. And, and let me be very clear when I say this, I had no idea what I was doing. Right. I think folks, because I'm a very intentional person, people who know me personally are just like, I'm very intentional. I have a direction. I have an opinion, all of those things, but I also leave room for magic. And I think that that's the child, the curious child that still lives in me. I think that that is the creative that still lives in me. You have to leave room for the magic. And that's kind of what the community taught me. You know, and it took it took a stance of not feeling like you have to be in control of everything, but really listening to them when they tell you what they want. But I started with 100 people and the thing just blew up within six months of the the tribe starting. We were in the pages of Ebony magazine at our first write up like it happened so fast. Synchronicity, alignment, really, yeah. truly, really, truly um, discovering your purpose and not doing it from a place of like, how can I make money? Because, right. I, you know, I think the fact I think what worked in your favor and what works in a lot of people's favor is when you're not so intentional that everything is, you know, so mapped out. Because when you do it that way, you sometimes do box yourself in. And yeah. you, as, as you said it, and I love it, you don't leave room for the magic. You don't yeah. make room for the magic. So I love that. That's probably going to be the title of this episode because I like I, that. I, I love that. And so that I was going to ask you, and you already answered my question um, with, did you have to deal with like the doubts and the fears of other people? Because it's one thing when you're saying, okay, I'm going to start a business. Usually the conversation is I'm going to quit this comfortable job. You know, I'm going to leave this career. I'm going to start a business. And our family doesn't necessarily, like they're not hating on us. They just have our best interests at heart. And a lot of times entrepreneurship is scary. It's risky. What you were doing was scary and risky. And I love that they were supporting you through it until you had a real scare, you know, yeah. and they were like, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see, you know, the possible downside of, of what you're doing. But I love that, you know, that they were open and willing to support you while you figured it out. Yeah. Or they just stayed in their own. We don't really know what the hell she's doing, but she checks in. So <laughs> like, we're not going to bother her. We ain't going to yeah, bother her. And I think, yeah. and knowing my mother and just kind of the way that she navigates, I'm sure there were conversations happening on the home front that I'm still to this day unaware of. I think they probably had their concerns and stuff, but my mother always tells people, she's like, you, she's like, your brother was always up underneath me. You, from the time you were born, you have one foot out the door. So I didn't know how it was going to manifest, but I'm not surprised Mm -hmm. at what's happened. And so I I think she kind of just like allowed that freedom and probably had panic calls with her close girlfriends and family members, but she didn't really lay that on me, you know, like, yeah, it is. And I, and I, and I'm really grateful for it. And I, you know, can't wait to gift that over to my own children, but it's just like, there's, there's a different type of energy and vibe when you have that support. So let me ask you this, because another conversation I find myself having often is for most successful entrepreneurs that I sit down with, they have attended college, right? But they're not necessarily utilizing their degree. So we have mixed opinions and mixed feelings about what we're going to teach or encourage our children to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I know that you, you know, in some ways you are definitely still utilizing your background and your degree, but what do you feel like your opinion will Mm -hmm. be when it comes to your children wanting to, wanting to explore their, their college? I got into an argument with a cousin about this a number of years ago. 
Um, because a lot of people, you know, and a lot of it's old school mentality, they're just like, you're absolutely going to college. And I was just like, mm, nah. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I was just like, first off, y'all need to definitely not act surprised. Cause if anybody's the black sheep in this family, it's me. So like, just get used to everything, you know? Mm -hmm. But what I said was after my child, um, finishes high school, if they truly don't feel like college is for them, at least not in that moment. I will give them the summer to come up with a business plan. And I want something concisely broken down that you are going to put your time, your effort, your energy, your interest towards to make sure that something is being developed. Mm -hmm. So you will have options. It will not be a tell all end all, um, but you have to have something in play. That's really my opinion on that. I love that. I love that the the forward thinking, the fact that you have cuz I've said similar things but I don't have it nailed down with all the details like you do. And I do think that there are definitely, you know, tremendous benefits to going to college besides just getting mm -hmm. the degree um that you can't replace with The social you, aspect is right, like the social aspect, the Absolutely. development of your independence. Like there's just so many things that you learn mm -hmm. during that experience, the network even. Um so there's some things that you know you can't just replace but i love um that you have like this structure put to yeah it. Like, these and are hey, your options. you may work at something for a year and realize it's not for you and then you want to pick up school dope listen you know what i'm saying do anything that you want time is damn near an illusion like mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah. it's just it's all of these things i think we we bottle ourselves up in so many ways and restrict ourselves with so many parameters that I think society has really put on us. You have to yeah. do this by this and go there by this. And it's yeah. like, I've just, I've lived a life where I've literally not even to prove them wrong, but just eradicated a lot of those things and still feel whole, you know? And that's really what I want. I want my children to have like a holistic life experience and, you know, feel like they can just travel to the world. I always said I wanted to have kids once I could afford to, um, to be able to take them to the places that they were learning about in school. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing for me because I hated people laugh when they hear this. I hated social studies. I hated geography class, like all of those things I was not. And they were like, what? I'm like, y'all don't understand that I'm really a creative. So I was writing an English class. I was taking on as many art electives as I could. I was a creative. I was like, I was an excellent student top of my class, but it's just because I'm like, because I'm just a studious person and I get shit done. Like mm -hmm. that's how I was good in school. If it was classes that I weren't, I wasn't actually interested in. And so I was like, just cause you're good at something doesn't mean that's what you need to be doing. Right. And, and I, it took me a while, especially in like high school, college to really make that distinction. When you start having to pick and pay for majors, you got to start having that conversation with yourself. Yeah. yeah. And so for me, it was, it, there was some like maneuvering that had to happen around that time, but I was just memorizing dates in social studies class to get through tests. Yep, and I was yep, like, yep. damn, as I started traveling as an adult, I was like, shit, I wish I could take those classes again now mm -hmm. because I have a brand new respect because I'm here and they're tangible to me and I can touch these places and hear about the actual history from the people. So yeah. I think, you know, I don't know, maybe there's like a adult redo. <laughs> <laughs> Get a little do over. Well, yeah, you can definitely, I mean, you know, with your children, you'll be going, you'll world be going through it. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. it. That's you'll it. be going through it and you have so much to share. So, you know, so you yeah. can add value in so many ways because you've been there. You have the photos, you know, to yeah. show the real life examples. So I love that for you. And I love that for your children. You. Um, so you don't know this. I don't think I told you this before, but I actually, a friend of mine, um, Jerry actually told me about No Madness Tribe probably in 2012, maybe even yeah. 2011 when you started it. So I, have I know a couple of Jerry's. I know Jerry Seaway. Jerry and, um, Johnson. Is his last name Johnson? Okay. No. I think wait, I dated oh a Jerry God. once. <laughs> okay. I'm going to, I'm out. Look, I'll message you later when I figure out this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. They're oh all good God. people. I have nothing ill to McPherson. say. McPherson. Yes, McPherson. yes, yes, yes. You know, That's my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Moving on. Yeah, he, listen, he definitely was plugging you back in the day. Okay. Like, yeah, no, he's an amazing dope. supporter. He's engaged, about to be married. Is huge. He? Yeah, huge, huge, huge supporter. He's an amazing guy. And I what I love him. about him is there's a whole like dope crew of them. Shout out to DMF. Like, you know, there's just a group of them that I know and have known No Madness from the beginning. And I've even known them outside of it. Mm -hmm. And it's just, they're an amazing crop of men. Like I say that, but I say it with nothing but the utmost respect for him. Like yeah, amazing he, crop of 
person. He was definitely like singing your praises, telling me I needed to tap in. And here we are. 10 yeah. years later. So I'm excited that I was able um, to connect with you. And I'm even more excited that I'm able to plug other people in with you, especially because you mentioned the fact that y'all are 31,000 strong, the majority black women, my people are mm -hmm. definitely black women. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask you in relation to um, your world travel, what have you seen or have you seen any misconceptions about black women in your travels? Like the mm -hmm. perception that, that people around the world have about the American black woman. Mm. Okay. So I think it's very important to acknowledge privilege when it's relevant to answering a question. And I have light skin privilege. Um, my hair is straight today because I got it trimmed yesterday, but it's very curly and big. And I'm very culturally ambiguous looking in most places that I travel to. And I've definitely used that to my benefit. Right. So I'm going to start with that because I think it's important to acknowledge it. Um, when I, when we do group trips for nomadness, there are, women and men of all shades and hues and shapes and sizes and abilities and all of that stuff that are a part of our community. And so we have, I remember there was something that went down in Madrid. Mm -hmm. It was on one of our trips and we never went back to Madrid. We actually, it was the running with the bulls. It was the first time that we did the trip and we had stayed in Madrid. Every other year after that, we moved to Barcelona as the home base and then drove to Pamplona and came back. Um, where there was a restaurant that was clearly open. You know, it was during the business hours, this, that, and the other. And there were a group of ladies in particular on my trip who had approached this restaurant about going in there and were like vehemently denied. And it started to ensue this like conversation and this like racial meets like classist type of situation started to pop up. And I wasn't there with them, but I was, I was very much there and involved in the conversations when they got back to the house. And it was one of those moments that was really eye-opening for me. Um, even in, I mean, I have members who also in Spain around La Ramblas, but love La Ramblas is crazy anyway. But, um, you know, being black, they automatically think you're like a prostitute or something else. You know what I'm saying? Like something of that nature. And that happens in a number of places around the world. Um, and it's just like, because a lot of these countries, especially around the Mediterranean, they're right above Africa. And so there's a lot of, you know, African people that are coming over, but they do, it's kind of like work immigration, the way that our relationship kind of is with like Mexico. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. you know what I'm saying? It's like that version over the Mediterranean and the top of Africa. And so you'll find these really interesting kind of like relations when it comes to different races and backgrounds and genders in these areas. Um, but that's one that definitely came, came our way. Um, there was another issue that happened on one of our trips in Bali. And that was, so the funny thing was the, the crew didn't know um, that there was a racial background, but I knew, and I made the decision as the leader to take on that fight myself and not incite a literal riot on this can on this like compound if they knew the gory details behind what was going on and why nobody was cleaning their room and their towels and the pool and things of that nature right so you kind of like i tell people too because and I, this is the reason why i say i have an issue with the term travel influencers because i don't see myself as a travel influencer i'm a community organizer and when you are a community organizer and a community leader you've got to have a real honest conversation with yourself about what type of leader you are are you a leader that wants to be in the background? Are you going to be the face of your brand? What is the situation? Because I tell people I have shown up for no madness when it was pretty and when it was shitty. And that type of consistency over time, that type of sweat equity, emotional equity that you put into people is what builds trust. You know, mm -hmm. what builds people. I think you asked me in the very beginning if like, you know, there was like an issue with people trusting me eerily. No. Um, and I'm glad, and I don't take that for granted because I'm a good, I, I very, you know, easily will say I'm a good person. I trust myself with certain things that I wouldn't trust other people with because I'm a good person. Do I fuck up? Yeah, absolutely. But are my intentions 90 something percent of the time aligned with my actions in a positive direction? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. It may be misunderstood, but it starts there. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't really do it. These people very eagerly and very fast started to give me money. <laughs> 
And I was like, I don't know what this is. And I thought I was just creating a community, but like a couple months into it, it was like, okay, so I have to incorporate a business. Like what, what's that? Remember I'm a creative, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm coming in here now getting like thrown into the fire and there's still stuff I'm learning. You know what I'm saying? Like getting thrown into the fire of all of this business stuff. And so I just was like, okay, let's listen to the call um, adhere to it and see what happens. And, you know, that's really how we built out. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this theme going on on social media right now where, you know, everybody's posting like the places they've traveled to that, you know, they felt safe as a black man or as a black woman. And in the midst of COVID being like really, really a thing, um, which I'm sure it was a thing everywhere. But of course, you only know what's going on in your backyard. Mm -hmm. um, one of the conversations that was happening was like, I'm leaving the country. Mm -hmm. And my question, you know, I was having a conversation too, but my question was well, like, where are we going to go? So mm -hmm. what in your opinion are some of those places that are safe spaces for, mm -hmm. you know, black people? Um, if, you know, somebody watching this is like ready to not necessarily like run away from the U S but explore. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think there's so many. And it's funny, we were abroad when COVID hit. We, we had 45 people in India. Literally, wow. when 45 got on the horn talking about everybody needs to be home within like 72 hours, we had literally just walked through security at the Taj Mahal. Wow. Yeah. So we know what it looks like from the outside in the middle of all that chaos before knowing what the hell this thing was, but knowing that it was spreading and becoming a thing. So yeah, we got we got some uh <laughs> some experience with that as well. Um, I mean, I'm always a big staunch advocate of the continent, right? Like getting back to Africa, the two places I travel to the most most frequently are India and South Africa. South okay. Africa is very much home for me. Um, I love it. And I love Johannesburg. I pick Johannesburg over Cape Town a lot of the times, but I got love for Cape Town. I got love for Durban. Like there's a bunch of places that just resonate with beauty and even calm outside of the cities in South Africa that a lot of folks don't give a chance. They don't even research it. So I'm big about being on the continent. Um, Tanzania was open the entire time damn near as well. So like Zanzibar was an island that a lot of people were getting reprieve and were really found really welcoming. Um, I actually went viral while I was in Bermuda during um, COVID. I had, it was October of 2020. They did like their first like socially distanced COVID relevant um, tourism summit. And they had me come down, they flew me in and I was so impressed with their protocols. Like you had to take a test. They had like a hazard tent set up at the airport um, in the parking lot. You had to take a test there. You get the results back within eight hours. The hotel gives you what they call an isolation key. So you're in your room and you can't leave your room or else you'll be locked out until you get the negative result from the airport. Mm -hmm. Then you can go down and get a regular key. Like there were just these things that they had garnered up and protocols that was like beyond anything I feel like the U.S. could have conceived, let alone executed. But I felt safe and they didn't pay me to say it. Like, and I went mm -hmm. on and I ended up like in the newspaper and on the news channel and like people recognizing me when I was at the airport leaving the next day. Like it was so weird, but it was me giving them props because they really took to, you could understand when a place cares about their people, you know, mm -hmm. where I feel like everybody was flocking to Tulum, but Tulum got dangerous during COVID and not just with like the cartels, which they started shooting up beaches, but also like these brunches that were happening and it's packed and people are on tables. And I'm like, y'all, there's still a pandemic. And what was happening that you didn't see is you would see your friends have amazing times in Tulum but you don't understand that they were getting the residents sick, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it's like your impact is bigger than just the days that you have there. You know, right. the conversation that is very prevalent right now around Hawaii, you know, during one of our um, Audacity, one of our digital festivals, we had Havani, she's a singer, indigenous Hawaiian, come on board and she told us straight up, Hawaii's fucking closed. Like closed, because you all come here you bring all of your shit with you. We are an island with limited resources. We cannot handle an outbreak. And you do not treat our island kindly when you come here. And what she said was so impactful. One, I started crying on the panel, which had never happened. And mm -hmm. two, we had people who were watching the event hit us up afterwards who had trips already booked to Hawaii, cancel them. Mm -hmm. The social we've responsibility gotta, of it all. Yeah, like we've got to start asking ourselves, whose land is this? 
And what are we doing while we're there? I'm very big. I just got back from shooting amazing content for almost two weeks in Alaska, profiling indigenous neighborhoods. I can't wait for that content to come out later. I just got back from Asheville a couple of weeks after that, shooting the black neighborhoods. I'm very big on being on camera and using my positionality in the travel industry and my mouth to explore and amplify black indigenous latinx like what are these neighborhoods like in these places because when you see the generic marketing videos those tourism videos it don't look like us mm -hmm. it don't look like us and even if if you see a couple folks of color in it we are so intersectional we are so intersectional so you're talking about women you're talking about gender you're talking about lgbtqia plus you're talking about accessibility right different varying levels of being able-bodied. You're talking about all of these things that represent intersections, religious intersections. Muslim travel was supposed to bring in over $200 billion before COVID hit in that next fiscal year. You don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Why are there not more like halal options? You know, it, it's, it's those things that if you don't pay attention, you just kind of fall into what's been and mm -hmm. you're missing out on not just like the responsibility, but even also like the fiscal profit on the on the back end of it. You know, like there's a home for this stuff. I always say like if the tourism industry was doing what it was supposed to do, I wouldn't have a job <laughs> like there would be no need for no madness, you know, but. So, OK, so are. so that so I wanted to I definitely wanted to ask you about the pivot during the pandemic because yeah. we were all shaken up we were all yeah. scared in some sense around yeah. you know having an outside force like literally shutting us down where mm -hmm. we didn't have options and in this space travel i can imagine um i mean i don't want to put fear on you but i can imagine the uncertainty around you know what this meant for your business so what were what was your pivot strategy um during during the pandemic at first it was survive, like real talk, because this is what happened to us candidly, six figure nest egg gone, damn near mm -hmm. overnight. And what that did, here's the thing, right? It's one thing to have income stop. That's one thing. It's a whole other animal when your income stops and then everybody wants refunds. Ooh, baby. Okay. It's a whole <laughs> the beast right there. Listen, because now you're bleeding backwards and it's a whole other animal. And remember what I said about showing up for people, showing up when it's shitty and it's pretty. What saved us was 10 years of relationship, of leadership, of sweat equity, of pouring into my community so that when a time showed up that none of us could have imagined, where I said, hey, nobody's hearing a no. We're just setting up a payment calendar and we need y'all to just give us some time. They all worked with us. They all worked with us. They were like, E, look, we got it. We understand. Mm -hmm. We understand. And so being communicative with them, being, I have no problem being like transparent with my community. That's never been an issue. But also again, it's that that's when your reputation becomes important. It's because people understand that this person is working through something. They're going to get stuff done. And I'm not hearing no. I'm just not hearing right now. You're hearing not right now. Time. Right. That's yeah. it. Nobody heard no. You know? And so that was important to us. And, and figuring out what that looked like over time. And also, we didn't rush. We saw a lot of our, like, counterparts, specifically, like, other groups that run trips, right? There are some groups where trips is just their whole model. That's not our case. And it's never been our case. So they were like, I can imagine what they went through too, because we had things like the festival to be able to like pivot off of. That was a big thing, turning our festival digital. We ended up executing six digital festivals in a year and a half. And we were able to still get sponsorship checks from some of our partners because we created an immersive event online that still bought hundreds of our members out and became a benefit for them to stay top of mind Mm -hmm. um, when they were ready to travel. And then what happened, which was great was once we were able to bring the festival back to person, which we're doing this September 10th in Newark, New Jersey, we were able to have our partners already engaged because they saw the way that we were still able to bring community out during literally the most like 
hectic and insane time for all of us in travel, right? They saw so, that you didn't quit on your people. Yo, we didn't quit on our, and our people ain't quit on us. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Thank God. Like they didn't quit on us. And so I just think that like, you've got to show up. Like you've got to look, you've got to be creative. This is where the creative mind is a beautiful thing to have because if you're too strategic, you're going to see all these numbers and get stuck and freak out. You can freak out, yeah. have your moment, but you've got to now get innovative and creative. I'm like, okay, what can we do? What can we execute? We got into the world of data aggregation. We had in six weeks, over 5,200 of our members fill out an 89 page quantitative and qualitative report that we were then able to present to the industry and get data clients because there's no real like you know there was only one data set at that point in time that talked about black travelers and we mm. got a bigger sample size than them in 24 hours promoting it to our community so there's just there's so many benefits and you just have to look at what are the areas that you want to show up in how do you want to get through the other side of this what do you bottom line need to survive and kind of put those pieces together and be really like creative and innovative about it. But we just, I mean, there was like a couple months where I was like, I feel like I'm pulling shit out of thin air, but you know, you but you have to make it work. Yeah, you have to do it. It's either that or die. You know, yeah. like when you're the CEO, it's it's that or die. And and you got to figure it out. And so we just, we, we figured it out. And also it's set up now a protocol where, where if we ever found ourselves in a situation like this again, we kind of know what to start to, you know, enact immediately what it could look like going over time. And again, mm -hmm. that like show upmanship of the community really makes a massive difference when you need them to be patient with you. That's really when it comes in benefit. I love it because you didn't just survive. You you literally figured out a way to thrive. And yeah. your creativity really, really came in handy and, yeah. you know, was full force in order for you to not just, you know, turn around and just give everybody their money back, but really figure out how you were going to work through it. And being able to lean on not only the relationships that you had with your tribe, but also the relationships that you had established with these brands right. that still believed in what you were right. doing. Because um, right. it was a scary time for them too, for sure. It was scary as hell. And also mm -hmm. it was a learning lesson for me because our relationship wasn't primarily brands. It was primarily destinations. What Got was really you. tricky to me was that we're like, we're a small business, right? Very lean team, location independent. We were sending emails a week into lockdown. No bullshit a week into lockdown and we're getting kickback emails by the dozens saying I'm furloughed for 90 days. I'm furloughed for, and I'm like, wait a second, how am I doing everything in my power as a way smaller business that does not get any governmental funding trying to keep afloat this small team? You know what I'm saying? That I'm paying on 1099s to make sure that I can even like put some money in their pocket. You know what I'm saying? And we're a week into this and nobody knows how long it's going to take. And your whole damn like <laughs> department is shut down. Like, what are you talking about? People were fired. People were furloughed. And it was immediate. And I was like, to me, that was scary. Yeah. For sure. That was scary. So, so I know that you mentioned you got some exciting things that we can't even talk about yet. I know you have yeah. the fest um, coming, but for the people who might not catch this before September 10th and be able yeah. to rock with you at this one, what are some things that we can look forward to seeing from the No Madness Travel Tribe? Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that I've loved about our partnerships um, over the last year or so is they've been really big into events. Like people are really trying to get outside. I love Louisville tourism. We ended up doing some events in DC, one in Atlanta wrapped around Derby with them. Um, another one with Muhammad Ali's family in DC. Mm. That was like amazing. We're What we're starting to see is our destination partners are really wanting us to show up in a lot of what they call their feeder cities. So cities in which they get a lot of traffic into mm -hmm. their, you know, their destination. And so I think what you're definitely going to see from us is we're going to be popping up a lot with our ambassadorships, with myself in a bunch of cities around the country. Um, and it's going to be really awesome, amazing events. Come out, get the drinks, get the food, get the vibe. And Tribe is really going to be 
Sorry, that was my alarm. No, you're good. <laughs> Tribe is really going to be everywhere. And so I think really looking at um, different cities around the country is going to be an amazing thing that people will see with us. Um, and yeah, when I get the okay to be able to like announce the other big stuff, I will. But well, yeah. they got to tap in with you. They got to yeah. tap in. They got to stay tuned um, so that they can see. And I love that you'll be, you know, all over. So they definitely will have an opportunity to connect. Yeah. With you. And we have um, ambassadors. Our ambassadors, they do meetups, you know, all the time. They're literally, we have dozens across the country. And so that's what's really cool too is that, you know, Nomadness Houston looks a little bit different from Nomadness Jersey, a little different from Nomadness Chicago. They've all got their swang, their lingo, mm -hmm. their vibe. And, and we want to honor all of it, you know? So yeah. it's important that we hit as many cities as we can. So I have your Instagram scrolling down below, but if there's a website or somewhere else where people can find you, stay connected and support you online, please share that. Yeah, I will. Um, so definitely for me personally, it's at Evie Robbie. Um, and for Nomadness Tribe, we have at Nomadness Tribe. And if you're interested in the festival, be it this year or next year, you can follow them at Nomadness Fest. Um, amazing lineups. We're really big in the Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Muslim community when it comes to travelers. Let's get that festival going as well. So you can find me on socials for sure. And if you want to join the tribe, just go to Nomadness Tribe, Nomadness Travel Tribe .com. And there's a tab there that says join tribe and you can check it out. Listen, y'all, you are always getting plugged in with the people who are <laughs> doing the damn thing here on Girl Stop Playing. Thank y'all for tuning in to another game changing episode. I'll see you next week. Thank you, Evie. Evie, you. you go by Evie. I go by Evie. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Evie. I'll see you soon because I got to get to one of these festivals. Yes. <laughs>